library, some of you I recognize some faces. So if you're wondering why we do this in the library, we see this as an extension of our library's mission to the open and free exchange of ideas in the same way that you're not necessarily going to agree with every single thing that you find in our books or our databases. You may not agree with everything you hear in this conversation or that people may not agree with what you're saying, but we ask that everyone is respectful of everyone else's opinions and perspective because we want this to remain a safe space and that people feel welcome here. So if you're interested in learning more about the topics that we have today, you'll notice on this lovely blue, lovely uh, tan counter that we have some books and we have more resources for you in the form of magazines, uh, online articles. So if you're interested in learning more, we are more than happy to help you. Mario's one of our other assistants and you'll see him as you leave this room at the desk outside. So next week, we're going to be having um, JT Stewart, who's a Seattle Central College the community, faculty um, emeritus, Laura Daw, Lawrence Mansuda, and Shankar Narangan lead the discussion um, entitled Raven Chronicles, Poets Examine Race, so under our skin. If you'd like to organize a conversation, we're booked for this quarter, so for next quarter, it'll still be here or it'll be an alum. Um, feel free to talk to me afterwards. We're more than happy. We have students, staff, faculty, community members come in and lead these discussions. But this week, Luis Lucas, a HIV outreach and education manager, yes, and Matthew Robinette, a community mobilization coordinator of Gay City Health Project, will be facilitating our discussion, which is entitled Gay City Sex Health Trends in Seattle. So please help me welcome Matthew and Luis. What an honor um, to be here with you guys. Um, I'm, I'm Luis, I'm originally from Costa Rica. I've um, been in the U.S. for about 25 years. I'm a Latino gay immigrant. I've um, been doing this work since 1991, 1992, something like that. Uh, back in that time, HIV was a little different uh, than what it is now. It's changed quite a bit. And it has also changed in terms of um, what it was even in the 80s. Um, so there's a lot of new information, there's a lot of new things going on, exciting new things, breakthrough new things that I'm hoping that you guys may have heard about or have been exposed through uh, in maybe the classes or the education or some of the literature review that you guys have done here in the courses. Um, I'm very proud to be part of A-City for about 10, 11 years now. I do a little bit of everything there uh, as a small nonprofit. We all have to wear many hats. We just down the street from you guys, just a few blocks away. Um, we, do, we do a lot of great work. In fact, I have been to your campus uh, many times. I've done some other educationals and also um, something that I'm very proud of, just bringing HIV testing into your own campus with a triangle uh, group. And we do this kind of collaborations, community collaborations with um, major educational entities, community colleges, CLU, um, Q Center at the UW, uh, the other center at um, South Seattle College. So we have a history of working and networking with your colleges and campuses through time because we believed in the um, bringing the services to community, not just waiting for community or students or folks to come to us um, for many different reasons. You know, the community model is, is a great model. Mm -hmm. So we always like to bring the service to them. All of you guys. So. Wonderful. And I'm Matthew Robinette, and I also work at Gay City Health Project. Uh, I'm new to HIV prevention, and I say new as I have been around for 17 years. Um, 17, right? Just a long time. He's old. Um, <laughs> you see how he is. <laughs> but I have been working um, with the community for a long time. I've done a lot of volunteer work with the LGBT community. Uh, it was at Gay City. Um, and I got hired on to do some volunteer program coordination for Gay City in 2010. Um, I really look forward to talking with groups about HIV prevention because it really is very exciting. Things are very different than what they used to be. Um, there are a lot of new techniques for HIV prevention and, and, uh, and thoughts about those techniques too. So, you know, we have, uh, a community that has been marginalized, discriminated, um, 
stigmatized, all of the above, and you know, we have a lot of that that happens within our community as well. And so it is my hope today that you guys learn more about HIV prevention, what's actually going on, the issues that you have uh, on top of you know, medical issues per se, social issues around HIV prevention. Um, and yeah, just look forward to being here, so thank you. No question. What does LGBT stand for? Uh, lesbian, gay, bi, and transgender. Okay. And queer. And asexual. That's Q. Yeah. Q at the end and then an A for asexual as well. Yes. It's getting longer and longer. G it is. It's like LGBT, QA, I, or something like that. We'll just be sorry. Bisexual, transsexual. Queer. Queer and what? Queer and what? What is um, it? Yeah. <laughs> we have a question. Yeah. So, so what, what is the rate of, of HVI cases? HIV. HIV. You know, in Seattle, I mean, is it uh, stable, increasing, decreasing? But how, the, how's, the, how's the chart going? The Before we answer that, what do you guys think? As students of one of the most remarkable colleges in Seattle, what do you know? What have you heard? And there's no, you know, there's no right or wrong. I, mean, you know, but I don't know a lot of what's going on in, say, uh, cancer disease, for example. Uh, you know, just after this, you know, we belong to certain communities, and our interests in the communities drive us to study, work, or do a lot of, you know, field work because of where we belong. So there is no right or wrong answer. But I'm curious about what what you guys have heard, what's new, what's not new. You know, I mean, we we have some information from you guys, but. I'm the type of guy that likes to know, you know, we, we, we're having a conversation. When, when we were approached to do this, I, I told Mario, you know, you know, presentations that involve statistics and PowerPoint and all those things, they can be really great, but they can also be very boring. You know, like us talking down to you or, you know, we have the knowledge and, and, and we are here to provide it, but, you know, I don't believe in that kind of, I, I, I believe in more like give and take conversation and, and that's why I'm asking you. What's, what's going um, on? What, what uh, all I know, me personally, uh, the statistics I don't really know, like the question he asked. That's, I don't know what, the, but I, I, uh, I know it's not as prevalent on the news as it used to be, you know, HIV cases, you know, uh, uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, there were a lot of people that I personally knew that were contracting and dying from HIV, you know, or, or, or pneumonia, pneumonia. Maybe that's full-blown AIDS, when you get full-blown AIDS, which comes after HIV, is that right? That's correct. Yes, right, so I've had a few people that I've associated with that have passed away from pneumonia, and they said that's the cause of AIDS. But uh, I was kind of interested in, in the question that Mr. Uh, Larry, that Larry asked, is it decreasing, increasing? You know, all I know is I don't hear about it as much anymore. So to me, I guess it's decreasing. It is a good question. I think, you know, since I began doing this work, I have been able to witness that, um, at least in Seattle King County, we have become to a point where we kind of became stable. Like years ago, we were getting 400, 500 cases per year. This is new HIV diagnosis. Like new HIV diagnosis were at a level of 400, 500 back probably maybe 10 years ago. Then now with, with the newer prevention um, things that we're seeing nowadays in HIV, we have been able to come down to probably about 250, 280 a year. So that's a lot of decrease. But this is um, this is Seattle King County. Okay, this is not Washington State, and this is certainly, certainly not what we're seeing in the South. Uh, states like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Texas, the picture is completely different. So the epidemic in the U.S., um, we get about 60,000 cases in the entire country every year. Every year, that's how many we added to the 1 million plus cases that we already have. And those cases are already HIV, plus AIDS, because there is a difference. So those are combined. So as you can see, in, in the country, if you're in Miami, if you're in New York, if you're in Seattle, the picture is completely different. Um, 
Seattle is one of the most pronounced leading progressive biomedical HIV areas in the entire country. Uh, I can say that because I've traveled abroad and also here and I've gone to many other conferences where everybody looks at what we're doing locally, not only in the community level, but in the medical level, what institutions like Harborview, Madison Clinic, Life Long Meets Alliance, Gay City, what is it that we're doing here differently that had allowed us to be where we are today? And there are a few, uh, a few key things that I can say that have allowed us to be here where we say, oh, well, we got down so many cases per year. What is it that we're doing right? So to answer your question, it, it's been stable, leveled, down a bit. Um, Over you know, the last 10 years, though, right. we have seen a decrease of 25% in new questions. Right? Right. So, yeah. so in the last, things have changed drastically. 25%, that's a lot. Um, we have another goal to reduce that by another 25% by the end of 2016. So that's real quick. And we'll, we'll get into all those new ways that we're helping to prevent HIV, but I, I guess first I want to find out from you guys how what you guys know about HIV prevention. What ways do you know how to prevent HIV? Whoever, you first. You first. Oh, okay. um, I met a gentleman who was shelter for youth and young adults in a lot of our LGBTQ community. Uh, we run a lot of focus groups, and I've found that a large part of decreasing HIV and AIDS has been education. Uh, so a lot of our LGBTQ community in Seattle uh, goes out and educates others. You know, we have a program where they go out into schools and talk about it, um, which I think is incredible. Kind of like Planned Parenthood, but you know, more of that like youth feeling. And also, you know, homeless, you're getting paid type of job. Uh, yeah. So. Targeting it in that way, I think, has really helped. Um, and it's really cool to see, you know, like um, we've networked with Queer Youth Space at our shelter. And uh, That's awesome. so it's been cool to kind of be a part of that, but to also kind of see people getting involved and talking about it. So I think that that definitely helps when the word gets spread. Wonderful. Uh, prevention is the topic. Um, Protected, se protected sex. What does protected sex mean? To me, it means uh, prophylactic. A prophylactic. That's what, it, that's what it means to me, is a prophylactic, pro protected sex. Actually, the term prophylactic is usually used to describe something that prevents pregnancy. Right. What you're really talking about is barriers, and that's not just condoms. That's dental bands and gloves. Dental the bands and gloves. Mm -hmm. Gloves during sex. Yep. If your hand is going to touch any fluid that could transmit, then you want to go on it. So, the fluid, the bodily yeah. fluid can penetrate. Because if you have a tiny cut on your finger, then yeah. Okay. But yeah. If, I, if my hands aren't cut, say I don't have any openings on my hands, and I touch a female and get some female fluid on my hand, can that female fluid penetrate my hand and cause me to get HIV? No. Okay. No. So it has to be but, a break. There has to be a break of the skin. Usually, but um, it's HIV, easier. HIV has not changed its way of transmission. HIV is very specific. Which it is. It needs very. It needs a specific things inside of the body to link, to bind, to operate. It's one of the most clumsy viruses that we have in terms of it's not in the air, it's not in the water, it's not in the food, and there's a reason for that to be. So HIV must have certain conditions to be met to thrive and to do what it needs to do within a week or two of entering the body. So that's the reason why in 30 plus years that we have known about this disease in the U.S., although we have heard of cases about 80, 90 years ago, but it was documented in the early 80s, obviously, it hasn't changed, and it won't change, regardless of how far we get into uh, prevention of HIV, it's always continues to be the same. So the main modes of uh, transmission, what we call transmission, mm -hmm. continues to be sex and mm -hmm. continues to be IV drug users, so yeah, primarily um, mm -hmm. sharing needles who have not been cleaned, rinsed, etc. Those two ways are the primary ways they were the primary ways in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and even today. Okay. Thank you, sir, for that explanation. So you said, um, 
sharing needles and what else? Uh, unprotected, unprotected. Uh, penetrative sex, <coughs> anal sex, or vaginal sex, either or. Oral sex? There are cases mm -hmm. um, of, of oral sex. They say not to brush your teeth immediately before or after having oral sex just because you don't want to, like, you know, damage the gum lines and open up those sores. So through open wounds does... Through open wounds. Open wounds. Right, so if you have, like, an open wound on your hand that's even tiny... No. no. So I, mean, I, can, tell, I can tell you that in, in 20 years that I've been doing this kind of work, I can tell you with the fingers of one hand, probably three mm -hmm. cases in 20 years, that the patient tells me that they believe that was through oral sex, particularly uh, if they uh, swallowed semen or um, some sexual practices that they enjoy and liked. But even then, it was questionable because there were, you know, when you get the patient history, there are other things there, like drug use and multiple sex partners, etc., that you may come into question. Well, you know, so it's very. It, for me, at least, uh, as, a, as a provider, has been very, very rare. I mean, I can tell you that all the HIV-positive diagnosis that I have given through time, mm -hmm. I can tell you that it has been primarily uh, unprotected anal sex or vaginal sex. I think the reason why I say this is my uncle actually died because he was a doctor in a clinic, mm -hmm. and one day, because it was very, very hot out, he ended up making a mistake and wore sandals to work, and he actually had a, uh, an open wound on his foot and a uh, patient who was very, very sick um, uh, uncontrollably released some bodily fluid onto him, and he, he died wow. because he contracted it and he died. Wow. So barriers wow. over yeah, all that's, that's, that's a very interesting story. It sure is. I have a question. <laughs> it sure is. I have a question for you. Um, sure, let's oh, go ahead. Let's hear from uh, Yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, I heard that how far is true. I don't know. If you met with uh, a female that is infected with the IV, your chance is one person only. Uh, you will infect one person. 99% you will not be infected. I don't know how far it's true. Uh, the, the explanation is if you have wound or something, or if the woman's vagina is very narrow and something, you know, scratched in the middle of the types, you will be infected. So it's not clear to me how far is true. If you are met with a lady that's infected, the chance is one person the same. Uh, so you're talking about the, the, the partner is a female, HIV positive, the man is negative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, okay, you. You're getting into, into an interesting thing, which is the anatomy and the biology of the transmission of HIV. So through anal sex, unfortunately, because of how different the rectum and the vagina are, and some of the protective um, things that these organs have, vaginal sex is usually, com compared to anal sex, and I want to be very clear, compared to anal sex, vaginal sex is less, so it doesn't sound, it's less possibilities compared to anal sex. Right, right. So because the vagina has built in certain mechanisms of right. protection. I have cases of patients where it's exactly the, the same, where the, 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 the female partner is HIV positive and then the partner, uh, who's the penetrative uh, partner obviously, who's the one that inserts, is negative. So and they worry about whale, you know, do I use extra lube? Do we get tested every three months or every six? And, and also, it really depends on another factor that has become very popular nowadays maybe in the last five or 10 years, which is the undetectability of the virus in the blood and vaginal fluids. So we have seen tons of, tons of cases where if the female partner has reached a, the HIV viral load completely undetectable, which is below 100 or 50 copies per uh, mean liter of blood, that's when the patient, we call them undetectable. That possibilities of transmission from the partner to the negative partner is 95, 96% chance that it won't happen. This is something that we were not able to dream of just a few years ago. Why is that? Because the medication that we have developed, that these pharmaceuticals have developed, have become so 
powerful, so great, so strong, so potent, that it, we have become to the point where we have controlled HIV inside of the blood, inside of the uh, body fluid, such as semen, and we don't see that many cases. So I got patients that come to my room and say, oh God, um, you know, I'm having unprotective adenocytes with my partner and she's being undetectable and we're not using condoms and, you know, you still want to do a little bit of HIV 101 education just to make sure that they're taking all the necessary precautions. But they repeatedly come to, to us and every time I deliver the HIV result continues to be negative. Now, is that 100% that is going to begin to happen every single time? We cannot guarantee it because there can be other things that can be in there like a, an additional STD, for example or a, a, a fissure inside of the um, a vaginal canal or something like that, then you add in all those sort of possibilities there. But it amazed me that every single time I got that scenario where, you know, it's undetectable and they have unprotected vaginal sex every day or every week, and still the HIV, uh, the test for the negative person continues to become negative. This is something new. We didn't see this before. Mm -hmm. um, my question, <clears throat> it's in relation to you were talking about the education that's offered and um, you were saying that you've been in this for over 20 years and seeing that there's so, so, like such a small amount of people with HIV here compared to everywhere else, mm -hmm. what do you think is the main culprit? Is it, is it the, the lack of education or is it just choosing to not be protected? Is it a social stigma that people are hiding from? What's the main culprit? What's the reason for it, this raised amount of people with? Compared to Seattle? Yeah, yeah. because well, we in Seattle we got 5,000, close to 6,000 cases since we began collecting uh, data back in the 80s. So, you know, public health in county does a marvelous job collecting. So, for example, when, when I have to diagnose somebody with HIV, which I have, mm -hmm. then I, we connect them to HIV care. Usually, the Madison Clinic at Harborview is the one that we are contracted with to refer the, the newly diagnosed patient, which get into social work, uh, HIV specialist, and then they report that case to the state. And the state looks at how many do we have all this time. So we got about 6,000 cases, and remember, every year we add, you know, the 200, 250 that I said, from the entire county, it's not just Gate City. We get about 40, between 30 and 40 in our clinic down the road. So to answer your question, I think, um, you know, in the South, there are cultural, uh, social, and economic forces okay. that are driving why is it that we're seeing <coughs> what we're seeing in the South? What is it that a gay black man who lives in Georgia has this many more possibilities to become infected than somebody who lives in South Dakota or somebody who lives in Seattle. You know, services available, uh, testing, newer technologies are not available by spread in the entire country. We have the newer technology of the one minute insti Canadian based test just about nine months ago and I go around the country and say, okay, so what technologies of testing do you know? Oh, the blood draw, yeah, but that's old school. I mean, a lot of people still do that, obviously, for confirmation of a, of a positive one. But then, years ago, we were using OraQuick, which is now available at the drugstores, for a finger poke, blood-based, 20-minute test. But six months ago, we are using the INSI, which is one minute, less than one minute. So that has changed entirely what we have done in terms of HIV education. It totally revolutionized everything. I was totally blown away when we got that test just last year and how that impacted even our own clinic. And you touched on something that I think answers your question a little further is that Washington State is amazing, or at least King County, um, because we have connection to care. Yeah. So 92% uh, of people <laughs> who test positive in King County and are connected care. to care. Yeah. And uh, people who can't afford medications are on a med medication assistance program. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the gay men who I know who are using medication don't have insurance and they don't pay anything for their medication because the state provides that to them. So between education and then the state's stance on making sure that people are able to access treatment, mm -hmm. uh, those are two really big things. And you don't see that 
everywhere, right? You don't, in a lot of states, the state doesn't provide assistance, you know, or there is no, you know, we have such a great system to get people connected and, you know, what's the next step once they test positive? Well, they go to an orientation. And then from that orientation, they get their blood work done. And that's all done for free. And then from there, they get hooked up with, you know, medication assistance if they need it, so. And I think to further enhance your, your that more, and what we have discussed now nationally is that what are those driving forces, those social driving forces, invisible forces that usually don't get talked about, because researchers don't talk about, institutions don't want to acknowledge them, they're not part of any programs for HIV education, which is racism, oppression, um, you know, acculturation, assimilation for Latinos, for example, coming from different countries, different culture, not understanding those systems. Those forces, believe it or not, are causes or possible causes of people protecting health, health mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. and HIV being one of them. But mm -hmm. nobody talks about it. Nobody mm -hmm. talks about racism or oppression or how mm -hmm. they play a role mm -hmm. in HIV because those are invisible to you know to 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 the government. I have a go. Oh, go. What are the first signs of the um, HIV virus and how quickly does it start to show? Uh, that has changed also a little bit. Back in the day, uh, I had clients who, you know, the typical fever and the skin rash, particularly in this part of the body. Like this in part, part of, the of the body? In this part of the body. Why is it in this part of the body? Why do you think that skin rash is associated with syphilis or HIV? It usually, normally, comes in this part of the body. Why mm -hmm. is that? Because that's where the majority of our organs are. Oh. Liver, pancreas, stomach, everything else. That's where the majority of functional things that we need to live are hosted here. Mm. And that's where HIV hides and thrives and invades. Wow. Exactly. Good information. Now you said that's what, what it was. That was the, the indicator. Is it still? I'm sorry, say that again. Is it still? The way you phrased it, you said that that was oh, the um, indicator. Okay. Is it still? Okay. Um, if it's just, okay, HIV is like a fingerprint. It's unique in every single person. I got clients who come to me and say, you know, well, no symptoms of any kind. No swollen lymph nodes, whether it's here or here in the throat. No fever, no uh, skin rash, no nothing. And then the test comes back reactive. The test comes back positive. So, what we were doing 20 years ago does not apply now. We just cannot really, by the way you look, mm -hmm. by the way that your health is, you just can't. And there's a reason for that. It's because HIV has also changed exactly. itself, exactly. adapted, mutated it. Those, um, you know, the, the medication that we have had in the last 10 years have attenuated some of, some of the HIV components so that when somebody gets infected, we no longer see what we used to see in the past. Mm. Wow. So, yeah. And it's so related to the flu or the wow. cold that it can yeah. go unnoticed. Right. How long can it lay dormant? How long can HIV lay dormant before it's detected? Because I heard, that's one of the things I heard, like in the 90s, I remember they said it can lay dormant. Meaning, mm. meaning you can have it. I think that it can. It can be dormant, but I think when you first get infected, there's a surge of viral load, and, and, and that's detectable. Oh, because okay. your body has doesn't have the antibodies right. to fight it. So yeah. how long does it take? Good the point. The, once okay. HIV, say that HIV comes through the rectum, for example. It, again, I want to emphasize this is very different when it comes through the, the vagina or the rectum, because the, the vagina has a lot of protective organs and layers. The rectum has only one layer of protection. Very, very different. That's why HIV in the gay community, when people pop or bottom or use uh, anal sex, that's why, you know, for our community, it represents a much higher triple, you know, four times the risk. Uh, because mm -hmm. in the rectum, there's just one little tiny uh, um, layer mm -hmm. of protective cells. And I learned just a few weeks ago, Fred Hatch that some of the cells and the things that HIV must have to hook, to connect, are there in the rectum area. Mm. So as I, I was like asking myself, why is that? So now I know. So um, in the vagina, it's a, it's a little different. Um, 
you know, there are some pr uh, protections that are there that come with that, um, so that it's, it's, less, it's less risky. Yeah, still you asked a question. Huh? Still you asked a question. Which was, how long does it take for you? Two weeks. So usually when HIV comes into the body, in the first seven days that is inside of your bloodstream, it, seven to 14 days, it does what it does and it becomes irreversible. Totally, wow. you cannot change it because Ooh, it bound to the things that are there and you Ooh. cannot reverse that process and that person will be positive for the rest of their lives. Wow. So that's why we have a new thing called uh, PEP or PrEP. Those two things are biomedical interventions that we've been using for quite a bit. We have been using them in other diseases also to prevent. That's the thought of taking one pill to prevent disease. And those two are taking off in the last few years. And those are prophylactics. They're a PrEP, which is, stands for pre-exposure prophylactics. And that uh, is right now the manufacturer is Gilead and the pill is Truvada. Uh, there are other pills on the market uh, that the FDA is, or that they're studying for FDA approval, but right now it's Truvada. And what it is, it's, it's HIV medication at a lower dose. So let's say you're HIV positive and you're taking medication, you'd be taking a higher dose than what this PrEP is, and it's for HIV negative people who, do, who don't have HIV, who take this pill every single day to prevent them from mm. getting HIV, and it is effective. Wow. Uh, the study overall uh, was uh, about 44% effective, uh, but you had a lot of people in this study who were not taking the medication as prescribed. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people missed a lot of doses, uh, so they had to kind of like, of the study, take the people who, when they went for blood tests, uh, and actually showed that there was a level of, of medication in their blood sufficient mm -hmm. uh, to stop HIV, the, the percentage of that it's effective is 96 to 97 percent effective. Holy so what's the moral of the story is that you have to take the medication for it to be effective. But we know that already. We know that of other medications, hey, hey, right? You can't, those? you can't just be prescribed it. You have to actually take it. And it's something you take daily. So why are you taking those daily, like high blood pressure with medication or things like that? Um, can you have unprotected sex? So that is where we come to the definition of what is protected sex, right? So if, if someone is using a condom, we consider that protected sex. Right. If someone is using a medication, is that not still considered protected sex? Uh, yes, I don't know. What medication? It's called Trubata. It's been a lot of, and, and this is new, guys. This yeah, thing about PrEP true. is so new. It's really stirring up the wheels in many different in, in our own community, in the gay community, has really brought up conversations and forums and talks and presentations about is you know where are we going with all of this and, and is it effective? How effective it is? And who is the best candidate? At Gay City, we have a prep plan where we have one of the leading HIV doctors in Seattle, uh, part of the Madison Clinic Public Health, John Stecker. She is. Um, doing a prep clinic and she's going to have probably about 50 to 60 patients and she's looking at, um, it, you know, is this medication that Truvada make, made by Gilear working properly? But then again, what, what we have learned, this is not for everybody. Yeah. PrEP is a way of preventing HIV specifically and mostly for the most affected communities, which, you know, probably will be gay men. Uh, who might be a higher risk because of how concentrated HIV is within our own community. And if I understand your correction, your question, I believe your question was about condoms. Should should you still wear condoms? Right. Well, I'll take um, and the answer is yes, because PrEP doesn't protect you from all the other STDs. It only protects you from HIV. Oh, good point. Good point. Um, good point. So yes, you should still continue to wear condoms. Um, because it's just, you, it protects you from all those other things. So until there's a pill out for all those other things, yes, you should still wear condoms. Okay, I got something. Anybody else want to question? Go ahead. Please, for someone else, please. Uh, in uh, relation to social forces that we're talking about, why care is not as good, say, in the South as it is in Seattle, uh, I'd like to put in a very good word for the People's Harm Reduction Alliance, which is a totally volunteer group yourself. Uh, group that's been you know, doing needle exchange for, I forget, what, 10 or 20 years. Uh, and Shiloh Murphy is basically running it right now, says that he wants, uh, he wants the volunteers to be the same as the population being served. Uh, 
and no stigma. I think everybody deserves a little love, and so what he does is, is quite successful. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? I know we're giving you quite a lot of information. condensed yeah. information, but I mean, you know, feel free to bombard mm -hmm. us with any mm -hmm. kind. Of so you mentioned some of the economic barriers that have existed in the past, and so PrEP, is that covered by most insurance yes. carriers? It, it is. It is. Okay. Yep. How about Medicaid? Medicaid does cover it. It's cool. under HIV prevention, um, and it's, it's a new law that says if you are at risk for HIV, uh, all preventative care is free. So you get free HIV testing, um, a PrEP is uh, under that. Uh, also, too, uh, if your insurance covers it, but let's say you don't have very good insurance, then you still have like a 20% copay, because it is about $1,400 a month. So 20% of $1,400 a month, that's, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, it's $300, really. So um, the manufacturer of Gilead has a program to where they'll help pay, you, you apply, and if you have no insurance, they'll pay your entire cost. If you do have insurance, they'll pay up to $200 of your copay a month. So, there, yes, you, it is very accessible, which is amazing, right? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, something I thought was interesting was your point of the fact that it hasn't been brought up in the media recently, but it was, you know, um, in the 90s and in stuff. the 80s. Yeah, well, I'm old, so 80s, 90s, yeah, I was little <laughs> And um, do you think that it might be more compatible if it still was present in the media, or do you think that doesn't have anything to do with it? It's more of an awareness type of... Mm, good point. I think it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a double-edged sword. I think, you know, why is it that in communities of color, HIV is still a hidden prevalent disease compared to the white community? Um, and you know, it's like um, African Americans, for example. You know, I, you know, it's it's a small portion of the population locally mm -hmm. and in the U.S. But then the amount of HIV concentrated mm -hmm. in communities, and specifically in certain regions of the country, is staggering. It's yeah. crazy. So essentially, you're seeing that with people who are uninformed about HIV, there are higher rates, and it kind of just goes back and forth. But right. No so more than I, I think in, in the times of Twitter and Facebook and, so, and social media, you know, they really need to do a better job yeah. about informing. But then again, if you talk to a, a researcher or a reporter, they say, yeah, you know, um, HIV, oh, sure, you know, um, um, it's, not a, it's not a death sentence anymore. We all know that. People take one pill a day. It's not used to be like the 20 pills that people have to take. Then, um, they go and see the doctor. I have some of my young clients who go and see the doctor once every three, every six months, meaning twice a year, because as long as they are adhering 100% to that pill every day, you don't need to really go and see your HIV doctor like they used to every other week. Yes, we, we, don't, we don't live in those times anymore. So, yeah. I just, so has the Affordable Care Act had an effect on the people you serve or the way I don't know that we've had a, a big, we could see a big impact as of yet because it's so new, but potentially, you know, with HIV tests being free for, for everyone who's at risk of getting HIV, then, then yes, that does have a really big impact on our work. Um, the fact that people can access treatment has a really big impact on our work, on our, on our work right? Um, so I think that we'll see more of that as time goes on and we'll, we'll be better that are able to answer that question. I have a personal question. Sure. Um, you spoke about prejudices and things like that. Uh, when I first found out about homosexuals, bisexuals, or gay people in the 80s when I was able to understand what it was, I was prejudiced against gay people. I didn't know what it, what it meant. All I knew was men like men. Men felt more comfortable with being with men and women felt more comfortable being with women. And as I got older and had some life lessons, uh, the prejudiceness, I don't, you know, the last 20 years, I haven't looked at a gay person with any disdain. 
you know. And uh, I was just wondering, you being gay, do you look at heterosexuals? Do you have a prejudice against heterosexuals because they prefer to be home, uh, heter heterosexual? I just thought I'd ask that question. We were raised, I was raised, born, raised, grew up with my heterosexual parents. Yeah. Okay. I love them. I grew up in a society where 90% of folks are heterosexual and i part of that community. Um, so I think those layers, being an immigrant, being gay, being undocumented, where I was, undoc you know, I, what the government called an illegal immigrant or undocumented immigrant mm -hmm. for years and years and years back in the day, you know, it is how you look for compassion right. and understanding mm -hmm. to a person. You know, it's like we are in a time where we need to move beyond those layers. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, absolutely. No, fully okay, I appreciate that. I just want to know that because I know there's still people who look at uh, 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 gays, homosexuals, and, and, and don't like them. Right. You know, and, and what they call hate crimes, you know. You know, there's, right, especially in Seattle, we just had a, a quite the last couple of years, had quite a few men beat up coming from a bar and beat up and almost killed, you know, and I was just just wondering, you know, if you guys said, man, these, these uh, uh, heterosexual people are just, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Well, uh, thanks for sharing with me. Appreciate it. Any more thoughts? Comments? Yeah, I'll Questions? I mean, ha has this been interesting or at least very good, very good. That's a good man. I'm on a block. Thank you. Thank you. Good information. I've never even heard of PEP before. That's amazing. That's yeah, awesome. good. I've never even heard of it. Who's heard of PEP? I've never even I've never oh, heard of that. Okay, before. so let's let's touch on that. So PEP is uh, it's like a little older brother or sister. Mm -hmm. um, and it's per, it's post exposure prophylactics. So it's, a, it's HIV medication that you take after oh. you've been exposed to, oh. to HIV uh, within 72 hours of exposure. And it's a 28-day regimen of HIV medications uh, that stops you from acquiring HIV. So if there's HIV in your body and it's just starting to take hold, if you take HIV medications, and this has been... This has been proven um, effective. It's really hard because it's hard to actually say that someone was actually exposed because you can't detect HIV in your bloodstream after 72 hours. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that treatment, early treatment, is effective yeah. because babies have been cured lately of HIV from early that. treatment. So mm. they get on HIV medication as soon as possible, as soon as they've been delivered and born, and then um, HIV is no longer an issue. Now, that doesn't we don't know if that means it's gone for life or if it's just been pushed into a state of... And we won't know until those babies grow up. We won't know until they, until they grow up. Yeah. And those, they will be followed for a while. Right. Um, but early it's treatment really is, is proving to be very effective. Which is... Um, so, yes, you can take PEP. You go to the hospital after before 72 hours. You know, uh, there is an assistance program for that, too, through Gilead. Um, so that is an option. Um, yes. You said it's been 72 hours. How do you know you can't? You, you, know, you don't, you well, let's say that you have sex, you know, you didn't, you don't have sex that often, but you had sex and the condom broke and you know that person's status and they're mm -hmm. HIV positive. That would be an occurrence. That would be an incidence that you would probably want to go talk to a doctor and say, hey, I had sex with someone. Uh, I either did or didn't know their status. The condom broke and I would like to talk to you about that. As an option, so it's yeah. So what if you know what if seventy two hours passes? That becomes two weeks or something like that. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, they won't. It won't work because HIV has, like I said before, HIV has already done the connections you need to do inside of your body with the cells. It must bond, and those are irreversible. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to thank you guys. This is really informative mm -hmm. and. Like you were saying before, it's really not highlighted in the media, so these types of conversations are really helpful for anyone. And we want you guys yeah. to continue these conversations, because that is part of our goal at Gay City. We are working on a project to engage people who are going to engage in conversations around HIV and, and help talk about 
the stigma. What does it mean to be protected in today's world? Mm -hmm. You know, and we discussed that a little earlier before it was protected sex was condoms. You know, but we have other options now. People who don't like to use condoms, because people do, right? People, some people don't like to refuse condoms. They refuse to do it. We can either stigmatize them, we can shame them, we can guilt them into doing it, or we could come up with another option, right? And so PrEP is another option. So uh, talking about that, talking about HIV in today's world, uh, if you want to be involved in what's going on, it's called myhavmoment.org. The website's not up yet, but it will be up. Uh, in June, and uh, it'll be just a collection of people's stories. So why do you fight against, against HIV? What is your reason for wanting to be involved in HIV prevention? Or, or um, and share your story, share your picture with us, share your story with us, um, and, then, and then help tell people about it. Learn more information from the website. We'll give you, you know, information to arm yourself you know, to just talk about it with people. And then report back to us about how many people you've talked to, you know, or, or what the conversations were like, or how amazing, or what conflicts did you arise, what questions came Now up. you guys are all messengers. You guys are all messengers now. So, um, and I would love to hear all that information, so please email me. Like, if you had a conversation with your best friend tomorrow, and you're like, wow, I should email Matthew and let him know, please do. My email is matthew at gaycity.org. And if you would like to share your story, please email me as well. We are looking for people to share their stories. Uh, and tell us why you fight. Tell, you, tell us why this is important to you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Resources, the libraries have to help you with that, and if you have a minute, help me put that at the table. <laughs> <laughs>